Hi, so now I want to talk to you about the properties of the inner and the outer mitochondrial membrane and also about membrane dynamics and how mitochondria change size and shape over time. So we're going to start with the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is frequently abbreviated as IMN. The inner mitochondrial membrane, like most membranes in the cell, is formed by phospholipids, but it has a specific phospholipid, cardiolipin, in quite large quantities. Around 20% of the phospholipids of the inner mitochondrial membrane are cardiolipin. Cardiolipin is a very special phospholipid in which, in addition to two carbon acyl chains, the phospholipid head of this lipid also binds to two more acyl chains, so you have a total of four acyl chains. And this really changes the structure and function of this lipid. This is a very important lipid for organelles that maintain inner membrane potential. So it's present in mitochondria, and it's also present in thylakoid membranes. So it's really important for this maintenance of this proton gradient across those two membranes. So cardiolipin also has a function in the folding of membranes because of its characteristic with these four acyl chains, it tends to accumulate in folds of membranes such as folds in the crista, while other phospholipids which only have two acyl chains uh, will accumulate in other parts of the membrane. Now having said that, cardiolipin is not sufficient to fold the inner mitochondrial membrane the way it is folded within a mitochondrion in the cell. If you sonicate mitochondria, you break up these mitochondria, you break up the inner membrane, what you actually have is spontaneous um, reforming of these membranes, but reforming them inside out. So they will tend to reform with the inner part that usually is towards the matrix outwards. So cardiolipin itself is not sufficient. You do need an intact outer membrane, and you do need mitochondria within the cell to maintain the structure of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Not only is cardiolipin important for maintaining folds in the membrane, it's also important to maintain the structure of proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So we all learn that mitochondrial respiratory complexes, such as complex 1, 3, and 4 shown here, are inserted in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And when we learn them in undergrad courses, typically we see them floating around in the membrane as separate entities. But it has become very clear in the last few years that these complexes do not exist as separate entities. They actually assemble into super complex structures. And these super complex structures actually depend on the presence of cardiolipin in order to form. Super complexes are very important because they avoid that electron transport has to occur over very large distances. Electron transport can occur in very small distances of these complexes of respiratory complexes. So they're functionally important, these super complexes of respiratory chain components. So speaking of respiratory chain components and speaking of proteins of the inner mitochondrial membrane, a characteristic of the inner mitochondrial membrane that's different from most membranes in the cell is that there's actually more protein than lipid in this membrane. This is more of a proteolipidic membrane than a lipoproteus membrane. So more than 50% of the components of the inner mitochondrial membrane are proteins. And very important proteins in this, this sense are the electron transfer chain components and the ATP synthase. Now if you look at most textbooks and even in uh, figures in reputable sources such as nature.com, you will very frequently see the respiratory complexes inserted in the inner membrane and facing the intermembrane space, facing uh, a part of the mitochondrion in which the outer membrane is present. This is completely wrong. It's really wrong because 95% of the electron transport chain components and ATP synthase and the ATP ADP translocator transporter that brings ATP out of mitochondria and ADP into mitochondria are actually located on crista and not on the parts of the inner mitochondrial membrane that look towards the outer mitochondrial membrane that interact with the intermembrane space. So this scheme is wrong. And actually, if you look at Encyclopedia Britannica, they got it a little bit more right because they put these components on the Christi and not in the part of the inner membrane that faces the intermembrane space. 
So if the respiratory chain components are present mostly in the Christi, you would think that the membrane potential is formed mostly in Christa. And that is correct. Uh, we now know that if you use probes that accumulate relatively to the membrane potential, they will accumulate mostly in Christa and less in the intermembrane space. And interestingly, in a manner dependent on the tightness of Christa junctions, you can have different membrane potentials for different individual Christa. So across one single mitochondrion, you can have different membrane potentials because the membrane potential is mostly in Christa and because of the tightness of the Christa junction. Also in Christa is ATP synthase. So in the place in which the membrane potential is higher, it makes sense that ATP synthesis is happening. And actually, ATP synthase exists primarily as dimers on the tips of Christa. And these dimers actually fold the membrane so that these tips that are typical of mitochondrial structure form. So most of ATP synthesis is happening at the tips of these crista where these dimers of ATP synthase occur. Okay, so that's inner mitochondrial membrane structure. Let's talk now about outer mitochondrial membrane structure, um, often abbreviated as OMM. So the outer mitochondrial membrane is different in composition of lipids from the inner mitochondrial membrane. It can have some cardiolipin, but it is poor in cardiolipin, which is a mitochondrially specific lipid, by the way. Um, however, it does have cholesterol, which the inner membrane is very poor in. The composition of phospholipids of the outer mitochondrial membrane is actually very similar to the ER. And in some parts of the cell, these two membranes are actually contiguous. So the composition is the same, and they're also structurally related. It has a transporter in it, which is the voltage-dependent anion channel, or VDAC. And this is through which most things that are going to pass through the outer membrane actually are transported through. This is a large beta barrel protein that can allow for the transport of many different components and many different um, modulators and substrates of mitochondrial function. VDAC uh, is often thought of as something that allows anything to pass through it, but it's actually a regulated transporter. Uh, it's regulated by interactions with tubulins, so cell architecture is important to maintain mitochondrial function. It's regulated by metabolic signals, such as NAD, presence of lipids, and other signals within the cell. It can have a closed configuration or an open configuration, and when it's closed, it's poorly permeable to ADP and ATP, so it's regulatory of oxidative phosphorylation. VDAC is located mainly in the contact sites between the inner and the outer mitochondrial membrane. So those places in which the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane are closely related are where you're going to find the presence of this protein. And it's also regulated by the presence of proteins that are at the contact sites. So we saw now what the composition and the structure of these membranes is. Now let's talk about how mitochondrial membranes change over time. Now, mitochondrial morphology and dynamics has attracted a lot of attention of researchers in the last few years, but we actually know since the beginning of knowledge about mitochondria that mitochondria are not always those bean-shaped organelles that you see uh, in most textbooks describing what mitochondria are. So this is a figure from a paper from 1958 describing a single mitochondrion, and this is a drawing of this mitochondrion changing size and shape over time. So we already knew that mitochondria were dynamic then. There are movies from the 1960s showing mitochondrial dynamics, so this is not new. And actually, if you look at the name mitochondria, it means granule and thread, so it already describes an organelle that can have different sizes and shapes. Mitochondria are highly dynamic. What we know today is that mitochondria can vary from very, very hyperfused, they look kind of like spaghetti mitochondria here, to very, very tiny and fragmented granules and everything in between these two very different morphologies. The morphologies of mitochondria vary with cell type, they vary with metabolic state, they vary with the location within cells, their mitochondria that are going to be more elongated in part of the cell, more fragmented in another part of the cell. And they also vary over time. So mitochondrial morphology is dynamic. 
mitochondria are changing size and shape and also location within the cell all the time. This leads to the question if mitochondria are actually a single entity. When we look at a picture of mitochondria within a cell in one specific point, we're kind of tempted to count the number of mitochondria here and to think of them as separate entities. But if over time they're always exchanging material and changing size and shape, maybe they're a single entity. And in fact, there are cells in which there is one single mitochondrial reticulum, such as cardiomyocytes, for example. And in most cells, over time, most of the mitochondrial mass will exchange components with the rest of the mitochondrial network. So in a sense, they can act as a single entity. And this is really important because dynamics allows for the exchange of matrix components, for the exchange of membrane components, and for a healthier mitochondrial population because of this exchange. It also allows, for example, for the exchange of mitochondrial DNA uh, between single mitochondria. Uh, this allows also for the exclusion of defective organelles. If you exchange components, you maintain mitochondria in a more healthy state, but if you don't fuse into the network defective organelles, as we will see soon, you're going to eliminate components such as mitochondrial DNA that lead to the formation of defective mitochondria. So mitochondrial dynamics is really important. Mitochondrial dynamics depends on mitochondrial fission and mitochondrial fusion. And very simply, mitochondrial fission is the division of one mitochondrion into two mitochondria. This is mediated by a series of proteins, including DRP1. And mitochondrial fusion is the fusion of two mitochondria into one mitochondrion, mediated by many proteins, including mitofusin proteins, such as mitofusin 1 and mitofusin 2. So how does mitochondrial fusion occur? First, this is a fast process. It occurs in a time frame of minutes. You can see this happening dynamically within cells. Second, it's present in all eukaryotes, and the machinery for mitochondrial fusion is conserved through all eukaryotes. You could think that maybe mitochondrial fusion wouldn't be necessary. Mitochondrial fission is necessary because cells divide, so you have to divide mitochondria. But mitochondrial fusion might not have been necessary, except that it's present in all eukaryotes, so that really shows how important it is. And it's actually a process that's essential for animals. Mitochondria are going to fuse when they are, approach each other tip to tip, typically, and this fusion, this, this approximation between these two mitochondria is guided by actin. So the cytoskeleton is really important to maintain mitochondria in certain places in the cell and to guide this tip-to-tip -tip approximation. Once they are together and they hit each other, these mitochondria, not 100% of these approximations tip-to-tip -tip, are going to result in fusion. Actually, it's been quantified at around 20% of encounters leading to fusion. And this also depends on mitochondrial function. Mitochondria will only fuse if they have a healthy membrane potential. So mitochondria that have very low membrane potentials will not fuse, and you tend to have a more fragmented network of mitochondria under these conditions. This is thought to be essential to eliminate mitochondria that are defective, that have low membrane potentials, from the mitochondrial network. What guides mitochondrial fusion are mitochondrial fusion proteins like mitofusin 1 and mitofusin 2. They're going to guide outer membrane fusion. And after that, you're going to have remodeling of the Christi and inner membrane fusion that's mediated by proteins that mediate also remodeling of Christi, such as OPA1. So that's mitochondrial fusion. Let's look now at mitochondrial fission. Mitochondrial fission is obviously necessary because if a cell divides, mitochondria must divide. Mitochondria typically divide in locations that are marked by constriction promoted by the endoplasmic reticulum. So the ER is important to mark the mitochondrial fission site. After this location is marked by the ER, because of different stimuli that lead to mitochondrial fission, you could have a recruitment of a protein called DRP1 which is mitochondrial fission protein, to this location. And this recruitment uh, relies on many different modifications and the actions of other proteins. I'm not going to go into the details of all this recruitment of DRP1 to the fission site. 
Once DRP1 is recruited and activated, it's going to assemble, and it's going to assemble in kind of a ring form around the mitochondrial outer membrane, constricting this mitochondrion and dividing this mitochondrion into two mitochondria. For this to happen, actin and myosin must be present, so there's guidance of the, of the cell architecture for mitochondrial fission, and also this process is GTP-dependent. In fact, most of the proteins that regulate mitochondrial fission and fusion are GTPases. So mitochondrial fission uh, happens, mitochondrial fusion happens, and we also saw that Christi have different structure. Christi remodeling happens both during fission and fusion, and also happens independently of fission and fusion over time in a single mitochondria. And Christi remodeling can change both the tightness of the juncture and the characteristics of the Christi themselves. And there are also many proteins that mediate this, including the short and long forms of OPA1, which is a very important protein in guiding Christi remodeling. And I'm not going to go into all the details about this remodeling of the Christi. So basically, that's what I wanted to tell you about inner and outer membrane structure, and also how mitochondria are remodeled over time. In the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship of mitochondria and the rest of the cell, how they interact with other organelles and how they participate in some signaling processes. Bye.